Hey guys, how are you? Welcome back to my channel, The Fallen Pages. Today's book is A Brief History Everyone You Ever Lived by Adam Rutherford. So, this book is majorly about DNA and the lineage of mankind, and it's sort of a brief history of everyone who ever lived, as the title suggests. And the stories that are trapped, not, not, not trapped, they are stored in our genes, it's basically a mechanism of, uh, genes are basically a mechanism of understanding our history. That is what this book uh, suggests. And the writer explores the grand narrative uh, of human history through the lens of genetics and DNA. And this book is not merely a scientific uh, exposition, but an intricate tapestry uh, woven with history and culture and evolutionary biology. And Rutherford, the writer, uh, unpacks the myths and misconceptions about genetics and DNA and uh, dismantling the notion of racial purity and uh, tracing humanity's uh, complex and interconnected lineage with each other. And uh, this, this analysis in the book will, will, this analysis will examine the book's um, central themes, you know, and its historical implications and the broader philosophical and symbolic uh, meanings embedded within its discourse. Genetics um, acts as a storytelling device, which is sort of mentioned in this book, and uh, the writer crafts a compelling uh, narrative in which DNA serves as a historical manuscript of our whole lineage, of our ancestors. And unlike traditional histories uh, written by victors, the genetic uh, record provides an unaltered uh, testimony of our species journey up till now in this current era and by analyzing the genetic makers the markers scattered uh, across modern populations uh, in today's time the writer reveals a web uh, like a spider's web of migration interbreeding and adapt adaptation that that sort of defies rigid racial uh, and ethnic classifications one of the most striking revelations uh, is the concept of genetic inheritance and its paradoxical nature. And while our genomes um, hold traces of innumerable um, ancestors, the likelihood of any individual sharing direct lineage with a historical figure diminishes and uh, sort of diminishes over time. And uh, this dismantles the romanticized notion uh, of pure bloodlines, you know, and it reinforcing the reality uh, that all humans share a common ancestry. And then he talks about the, the historical uh, implications, uh, migration and civilizations of mankind from one point to another point. And the book challenges the traditional uh, eocentric, uh, eurocentric uh, historical perspective uh, by demonstrating that human migration uh, in, is the norm uh, rather than the exception. And genetic studies cor corroborate um, that all non-African humans descend from a small population um, that left Africa approximately 60,000 years ago. And from this foundation, the writer Rutherford explores how civilizations evolved over time and often thought of as distinct and isolated and, uh, entities and were shaped by interconnectional uh, gene flow and the lineage of each ancestor sort of like merged with the other uh, ancestry, uh, the birth tree and all of that. Let me just give you an example regarding that is that the genetic legacy of Mongol Empire, the Viking expansions and the Arabic, uh, Arabic conquests illustrate how conquerors did not merely subjugate but also uh, um, assimilated uh, with the populations they encountered uh, as they entered a new territory. And the genetic contributions of uh, Genghis Khan lineage uh, alone are estimated to, per to persist in a significant portion of today's population and demonstrating the lasting biological impact of historical events. And additionally, the book touches on the role of genetics in shaping historical diseases. And the Black Death, we all know, which devastated Europe in the 14th century, not only altered demographics, but uh, also left genetic imprints in our gnomes and uh, DNA. And the population that survived up to now, it still exists, the imprints 
of that disease and these imprints influence immune systems immune responses today and revealing how our genes carry the scars of historical traumas and then the writer sort of talks about uh, dismantling racial and genetic determinism uh, determinism and uh, the writer opposes the misuse uh, of genetics to justify uh, racial superiority and he illustrates the race is a social construct with no significant genetic foundation and variations in traits such as skin color are the result of localized adaptations uh, rather than markers of fundamental human uh, divisions. The book exposes how pseudoscientific claims of genetic determinism uh, have fueled eugenics and uh, eugenic movements and uh, colonialism and discriminatory uh, ideologies throughout history, racism all over history. So basically genes and our per perception of genes and uh, lineage has made these divisions in human uh, up to date. By highlighting the genetic influences among populations, the writer emphasizes that cultural constructs have often distorted our perception uh, of biological reality that surrounds us and the very idea of national or ethnic purity is debunked through genetic evidence which we have today and showcasing the irony that many nationalist ideologies are built upon an entirely flawed premise and there is this symbolism in our genes if you look at it uh, the echo it sort of echoes of the past you know like the past still exists in our dna and and it's it's there is this there is a profound poetism you know it's it's, it's so poetic that in the way our genes carry remnants of ancient humans human experiences and uh, it's sort of like, you know, the writer explores the DNA that existed in the past in our ancestors. In modern humans, exemplifies uh, this symbolism. The fact that many of us carry fragments uh, from a species once considered entirely separate speaks to the continuous blending and fusion that defines uh, human history. Furthermore, in the book, our genetic code serves as a biological archive of evolution's trial and error. And the presence of junk DNA, remnants of ancient viruses, and mutation that once conferred survival advantages all tell stories of adaptation, struggle, and persistence, and will. This reinforces a central theme that human identity is not fixed, but fluid shaped by the constant interplay between environment, chance, and necessity. The future of genes, genetics, and ethical considerations, um, this, this book does not merely dwell on the past, it also casts an eye forward into the future. And with advancements in genetic engineering and all sort of technologies that are coming nowadays, are, and personalized medicine, the writer warns of the ethical minefields ahead and while genetic research holds promise for eradicating hereditary diseases the extreme diseases it also poses the danger of reviving eugenic uh, ideologies in more insidious forms and who decides which traits are desirable how do we prevent genetic discrimination these are questions that science alone cannot answer you know, they require a dialogue between ethics, philosophy, and policy. Basically, the conclusion of this book is that it's sort of like it is a meditation of uh, human interconnectedness, you know. And the book serves as a reminder this, that despite our apparent differences, we are all uh, woven from the same genetic fabric and bound together by an ancient lineage, you know, uh, one shared ancestry in a world increasingly divided by artificial constructs of race and nationalism and ideologies Rutherford's work this this book the the writer is a timely and necessary call to recognize the unity inherent in our um, genetic heritage and through meticulous research and engaging storytelling the writer bridges the gap between science and history 
and the moral compass. Um, it's sort of like offer offering a lens through which we can better understand both our past and our future. Ultimately, this, this book is an invitation um, to view our existence not as isolated individuals living in the world alone, but as the latest chapter in a story of billion of years in the making. So I guess, yeah, this is, this is like basically sort of the crux of the book. It talks about the lineage, the ancestry, and all of that. It it also talks about in detail that, you know, there's this there's this line is that we piece together the past with the clues we can find and build up a hypothesis we can test and puzzle over, you know. So there there are like really beautiful lines written in a poetic manner in this book, and you know, it's it's a good researched book and. It's 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 a good read. So if you guys get this book, do do let me know in the comments below that what do you what do you think about the book? And there are other books by the same writer. I will be getting those also. And um, I guess yeah, this is this is it. And let's get back to the section where I share a poetry, uh, a sort of like a quote from uh, from a different culture or something like that. So today's quote is that from a French Enlightenment. Um, writer, a philosopher, uh, Voltaire, and he says that if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. So let's just talk about the interpretation of this this line. Um, the statement is often interpreted in multiple ways, you know, depending on philosophical and theological and ideological perspective, historical also. And the functional necessity of God which I've understood is that Voltaire suggests that even if there is no divine being, a supreme being, humanity would still need the concept of God to put them into place and to build laws and regulations. This is because religious belief historically uh, played a crucial role in, in moral order and law and social cohesion. And many societies have depended upon uh, on religion to enforce ethical behavior and justify governance and provide ex existential meaning. And sort of like a critique on this is that Voltaire did believe in a, in a creator and but rejected organized religions, uh, excesses and dogma. And the quote does not argue uh, for God existence per se, you know, because he believed in God, uh, a supreme being, and but rather acknowledges the practical function religion has served. And he saw religion as a necessary construct to maintain order and prevent chaos, even if he criticized organized uh, religion and faith. And the, the psychological need to, to have faith is that from a f psychological and existential uh, perspective standpoint, the quote implies that human, um, humans have this in incentric uh, need for purpose and morality and, you know, and meaning in their life and which religion often provides. And without a divine figure, people might create one to fulfill those needs. And sometimes if you do not have this ideology or theological God, you know, you tend to pray towards your, you tend to bow towards your feelings, your emotions and other stuff. If you do not have this uh, supreme being in your hierarchy of values and, you know, like without a divine, as Voltaire said, without a divine supreme being, we would tend to fall into... Uh, paganism per se and the power and invention of ideas some interpretations focuses on how human societies shape their own beliefs and whether or not god exists the very idea of god has shaped civilizations up to now laws and ethics and human interactions uh, throughout millennia and sort of like the historical and philosophical context if I were to observe this quote, was that Voltaire was a key figure of the Enlightenment of that time, of that era, and an era marked by reason and skepticism and critique of absolute religious authority. He argued against uh, superstition and uh, tyranny, 
and but acknowledge that belief in God should uh, could be beneficial uh, for ma maintaining moral behavior in our society and Voltaire reasoning influenced later philosophers the coming philosophers including Nietzsche and who famously declared God is dead because I think he was an atheist and there, there, there are different interpretations of his texts also I will be talking about Nietzsche also pointing out that without divine authority humanity must create its own moral compass its own moral frameworks to follow and when laws and regulations are given to human mankind, things tr uh, start to become really uh, out of focus. And today, this code's relevance in today's time is that the code is often evoked in debates and skepticism, um, and um, to, to for for a thinking society. You know, like it it is used as a code for morality and and the role of religion in governance and ethics. So yeah, I guess this is it guys. I um, hope you guys have a great day and I guess see you next time.